So uh, I will thank you again once more for coming with all the rain, etc., etc. But more specifically, uh, I will thank you in advance for following what's going to be a pretty technical presentation. Uh, and just a bit of introduction, uh, me and my colleague and mentor, uh, Elena, we work in uh, Sonar Source. It's a company that is mostly focused about code quality and code analyzers. And we specifically, we work on... Can and we, sorry, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, specifically we work on the JavaScript uh, analyzer and today we're going to go through the different code models that are required to write a code analyzer at multiple levels. The, our code analyzer, it works inside different contexts. We have uh, command line tools that execute the code analyzer. Um, we have platforms. It runs in Sonar Cloud, which is the cloud version uh, of the platform. It runs in uh, IDEs, most IDEs, uh, I would say. We specifically, we are, we are developing the analyzer itself. A bit closer, more, more close. Okay, uh, so and we work on the analyzer itself, not on all the tools around it that use the analyzer. Okay, so uh, let me show you what a code analyzer can typically find when you have all the models in place. So in this example here. Uh, we are saying that that condition that is uh, highlighted today is larger than and. Well, that condition is always true. So it doesn't make sense to have that, that, con that check there. And why do we say that? Well, if you look at is open there, is open is a, uh, is a logical end of start smaller than today, and today smaller than end. So it can be true only if both of those are true. Then if we move forward, we see that in fact, that check is in the else branch of is open. So it's when that is false, but that can be false for two different reasons. It can be false because of start is smaller than today, or because today is smaller than end. But since we are inside the else if, the else branch of another if, which is today is smaller than start, well, <laughs> the only thing that can happen is that today is larger than end. And you can take your time looking at it, of course. <laughs> take, take some moments. So, uh, today, I'm going to show you how we get there, how we get to find this stuff. And we start very low level. In fact, we start with the lowest possible level. Okay, so my turn to speak. Uh, so yeah, we will start with the low level things. And uh, for that, we will use uh, code examples in uh, ID. And to make it uh, more interesting, uh, we will take some particular rules to for, for the each model. Uh, for example, uh, here I have a rule about uh, uh, using octal number. When you prefix a number with zero, it's not anymore decimal, it becomes octal. So probably you didn't want to use octal number, what's the point in that? And you wanted to use, uh, you wanted just it to be three digits. And uh, uh, let's think what we, which information we need to raise this issue. Basic, th basic, th basic thing, we just need that to know that, okay, here is a number, and number starts with zero. But uh, you have an entire file, and uh, file text, and uh, knowing that somebody, somewhere in the file you have uh, digits starting with zero is not enough. So, for example, if I type add uh, the same thing to the identifier, obviously, come on, that's not a problem. And, uh, and uh, at this uh, uh, level, you need already to split things and uh, to know that, okay, here's the space, or even no space, here's an equal, and uh, here's a new thing starting, and you need to uh, consider it as a separate, as a separate thing. 
and uh, this uh, uh, sorry and this uh, level of uh, analysis we call lexical analysis so the lexical analysis is pretty simple it's just about what is commonly called tokenizing so you start by just identifying all the tokens in your piece of text and then you do some basic identification of what are the different tokens so it can be keywords punctuators literals yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to keep this thing this close so and and identifiers so you don't move much beyond that but it's already enough as you have seen because you know that that's a number literal for instance or is a string literal and this is what you basically can do at that level and then let's see how this is uh, actually implemented, typically this kind of tokenization. Uh, it will not be surprising to you, it's kind of a chain set of uh, regular expressions. And there is an order to these expressions, you uh, put them in, in such an order that there are no overlaps, etc., etc., and you write the regular expressions in a way that everything is exclusive. And the combination of all of these regular expressions, which we call channels, then it gives you all the tokens and groups them all in your uh, big list of tokens with the basic uh, uh, categorization, okay? Then, to move forward. Yeah, let's go a bit deeper. Uh, for a deeper case, I have still super trivial code. What we see here, we have curly brace, curly brace, I mean, open, close, curly brace, open, close. So from the previous uh, level point of view, what we have inside of the parentheses and what we have after them is exactly the same thing. So there are two uh, 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 punctuator tokens uh, followed by each other. Between them there is nothing. So, but uh, uh, here I'm talking about the rule about empty block. So yeah, empty block is a bit thin. Well, you probably sh should uh, write something inside. And uh, in order to raise this issue, of course, you need some additional information on the top of the tokens. You need to group these tokens. You need to, uh, to say, what is this token for? And uh, in order to do that, you do syntax. Uh, you, you, you build a syntax tree of the code. You, uh, you. Why did I say you? So, um, the syntax model is what most of the people associate to parsing so, and what most people associate to uh, code analysis. You get to this level of the model, you can implement a lot of different things. And what does, what does it mean? You take the tokens that you had identified initially and you start to group them together into logical structures. So in this case here, we have a function. This function has the keyword function, and then inside that function we can spot the different components. The function name, foo, the list of parameters, in this case only one, p, and then the body of the function, which in this case is an if statement. And then you go further and you go down uh, recursively. So inside the if, you have the condition, uh, strictly equals, and the body of the if, which is an invocation to a function. And then you go down, you have the left operator, the right, uh, the, the left operand, the right operand of the uh, strictly equals operator. And then inside the, the, the call, you identify the name of the function you are calling and the parameter that is being passed to it. Okay. And how do we build this? You build this by um, recursively uh, navigating inside the structures that you progressively try to match. So you try to say, okay, is this an if statement? Well, to be an if statement, it needs to start with an if. Then it must have a left parenthesis, then it must contain an expression, then it must con have a right parenthesis, then a statement, and optionally an else clause. And if it matches this, then it's an if statement, you create it as a node in the if statement. Same for object literal, it needs to start with left curly brace, etc. And this, of course, is recursive. So you are referring to other rules like expression, statement, etc., etc., etc. And they can be, uh, of course, uh, cyclic. So statement will contain the potential to have another if statement inside. Okay? Factory, or 
Mm. Yeah, indeed. So you're asking if this factory identifier that you have there uh, is pointing to all of this being a factory. If I have to be the object-oriented pattern purist, I would say that this is closer to a builder pattern. Uh, this is not a static factory. Let's say the name factory there is just to say this is our basic object to which I can concatenate my create expected, instances. Uh, yeah, create, create all the instances or try to match all of these uh, components. So don't expect that, for instance, this thing is an abstract factory that has five different implementations. It's the starting point of a builder pattern. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And if you have any questions to ask, you can also ask them now. We will stop you if it takes too long, of course. Okay, um, so, uh, and, and then if we go on next step, um, here I have a rule about unused uh, variable. Uh, made this uh, case a bit trickier because I have um, variable x declared here and then variable x again declared here, but uh, this one is used on next line and as it is a block uh, declaration, uh, this x is not the same x as here. If I would do it with var keyword, of course, it will be the same thing. Uh, with let and const, we have block declarations. So uh, I'm starting to talk about variables. Uh, here we need some semantic information to know that, okay, this identifier in this uh, syntax uh, tree, let's say, is not the same identifier as here, but this one is the same as here. And uh, if I will remove a constant uh, keyword and uh, so there is no more declaration for that x, that means that this x is the same as this x. So to uh, to in order to know that, we need to build our semantic model. So, uh, on top of the semantic uh, of the syntactic model, what you can build is this: um, you can start to correlate the different syntactic nodes that you had identified to start say, okay, this is an X identifier, but it's not just an X identifier; it's the same symbol that was declared before. So, in this case, you start and say, okay. I find that there is a parameter declaration called P, and then there is the same parameter is red in the second line. And then there is a function that is declared in the beginning of this, of this example, and it's invoked at the, at the end of this example. And then there is a variable that is declared. It's declared in the, uh, uh, almost the last line of the example, and it's written because we write the, the value 42, and it's red. So there we have a parameter called p and a variable co called p, but we don't mix them together, and we correlate with the different writes and read operations and declarations. Okay? Okay, uh, so I think we should go a bit faster. So uh, next step, uh, this uh, a rule which we call a dead store. That means that you put something to a variable and then you never use this uh, value. Either you rewrite it with another value or you just exit the, uh, the, the scope of the variable so the value is just thrown away. Uh, here I have variable x, uh, it is uh, rewritten in condition, uh, in, uh, yeah, in condition and uh, then we return the value so this value is never used. If we uh, do something here with the six, so we will return it if uh, it's else. Uh, uh, then uh, we are fine, uh, this value is will be used. Uh, here I started to speak about uh, paths of execution. And uh, in order to know which is, uh, where, what are the paths of execution in the uh, program, we need to build a control flow graph. Yeah, so, uh this code is a bit uh, unnatural, it's done a bit on purpose. But it's just to show you that control flow graphs can do stuff that is not natural to the developer and that's where things start to get interesting, in fact. 
So, for instance, what is the, f the first um, expression that is evaluated when this function is invoked, in your opinion? I'm not going to proceed unless you answer, so. <laughs> and there are t-shirts. <laughs> there, uh, there is nothing to proceed there is if no it is empty. empty. I think the first condition is assignment of i and p and r. So uh, the first thing happens. Assign, assignment of i. Because you are calling to call the function from outside, the first thing is going to get local parameter get initialized. Yeah, but from within the function. Yeah, starting with <laughs> <laughs> so the, Yeah, that's one of the options that it returns, but so first it must... No, that is below 10. No. No. The first thing that happens is this. It's the i uh, is smaller than 10. Okay? Then there is evaluation of the second part of the logical end. Then the invocation of array push. Then there is the, the incremental. That's where we increment. And then what happens? What happens after uh, this? I already oh, showed. you already showed. <laughs> Too easy. And this is the loop. It's and this is the, the model of the loop. And you can actually navigate it once you have built this graph this way. But there are other options that we have not yet covered. So the option where the second conditional is false, then it returns. And after it returns, end of this function graph. But there is one thing more that is still missing, one possible branch, which is, come on, try. The green are the one which are branching. Yeah. If, if, what is false? P is false. Uh, exactly, when I is more than 10, there is the shortcut. You don't even evaluate, you don't go through P equal 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 true. You just go directly to the return. So that's a different branch, okay? And then there is more, in fact. With this kind of graph, you go more into the details. Here we have compacted the thing, but I will show you the details of one of these calls. So in fact, what you get with this graph is more detailed, if you can. So first you read the array. You check, okay, this array, this array identifier is there, then you check that the property push of array is there. Then you check that i is there, and then finally, there is the invocation. And this is very useful when you have to create the control flow graph of one-liners that can have a ternary operators, et cetera, et cetera, and it, it's only one single line, and the control flow graph will navigate through these details. And then you can write your logic on top of this model. Okay? Quickly. How do you build this? Well, this is not for uh, SonarJS, it's the other analyzer we, we write, which is uh, for TypeScript. So you just navigate your uh, syntax, syntax tokens, or syntax nodes, from the bottom up, from the end of the function, and you say, okay, current is the latest block that you have created, and you say, okay, for the time being, it's the block that is used when it's false. Then, if the if statement that I'm analyzing contains an else, the real when false block is the one that is built from the if statement dot else statement. Okay? And then you proceed concatenating and you build all of this graph from the bottom up and you get cycles, et cetera, et cetera, with this kind of recursion starting from the syntax model. Okay, and finally, we come to the um, uh, most interesting part where we put all together. Uh, we put together our knowledge of the flow in the program, and we add in one more thing. Uh, we are starting to, uh, trying to track the values of variables. Not maybe exact values, but at least some knowledge about variables. Uh, in this example, uh, I have uh, a which is equal, which has the same value as x. I'm checking that x is zero, and if in this case I will increment x, and obviously then x will be greater than a. So this condition is always true. If, for example, I will uh, decrement it, then it will be um, less than, and we have condition which is always false. 
and uh, if, sorry. And uh, this we call a data flow uh, model. Um, in this uh, example of the code, I have a, a message and um, uh, so again, a small question for you. What will be the knowledge about the program at the point which these questions are showing? So like here, what do we know just from here? What do we know about variables? Yeah, exactly. So that's the, the mainly the, the only thing we know about uh, the program state in this point. Do you remember everyone who's answering? Only the good ones. <laughs> okay, good. So um, uh, then we starting to navigate our control flow graph and uh, uh, we enter first the um, uh, we enter in the if. At that point, as we entered it, we are sure that condition was true. That means that P was uh, true. And uh, message is still undefined uh, before this assignment. And uh, when we uh, go in further that flow, that uh, path of execution, we leave in this if, uh, message already has a different value, it was, was assigned, P is still equal true, we, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we execute our last uh, statement, everything is fine. Then let's imagine different path of execution. We didn't enter the if. If we didn't enter the if, we know that P was not true. And we know that message is still undefined. What will happen? Error, error. error, yeah. So we will have type error because we will call a property uh, on an undefined value. Um, and uh, that's mainly all the layers which we wanted to talk about. So um, in summary, and this is her metaphor in fact, uh, it's much. It's very similar to a compiler. Now it's strange to speak of compilers to uh, JavaScript people, but let's say also it's also true for transpilers. So um, all of these layers are very similar. The only difference is that where the compiler moves from semantic analysis to code generation, and then to code optimization. Well, instead of this, you replace other layers, which are data flow analysis, and then finally the rules on top that are using all of the models. Okay. And this is kind of it, and, but is it really all of it? There is one further step, which is the cross-procedure data flow model, which is what happens when you need to find stuff by going through functions. So in this case, for in this example, it's very similar to, to the example before, but we are not able to say that there is a branch that will cause uh, a problem, a type error, because the actual call to text dot upper to uppercase is inside a function, and we don't know what happens in the function. So what we have to do is that we propagate the information through the functions. And then we associate the value that was passed to the parameter to inside the function. And that way, we find that there is a problem. And this is kind of the next step for, for us. It's a cross-procedural data flow. So, we've gone through all of them. You get the type error, and that's it. Thanks a lot, and if you have any questions, if there is time for questions at all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Elena, Carlo, thank you very much.